then in the end we are coming to lobbying activities in Brussels, which I hope to clarify to everybody because it's uh, quite a bit um, yeah, going on, but um, it's sometimes a bit um, complicated to make it tangible, really. So, um, yeah, this I just presented. So market development, standardization, and a bit of lobbying activities. And just a few words before uh, about European bioplastics. Uh, we've been around for 20 years. We started out as a German association once upon a time in the 90s and have grown well, from 10 members, 10 founders, 12 founding members to about 70 companies now, mainly manufacturers and converters, but also some uh, people into feedstock production and also uh, regarding recycling some members. And, um, well, our focus for the last 10 years has more and more developed into the direction of Brussels. So we are not active on German level. We are focusing on what's developing in the Brussels area. Here, as I said, just a small selection of our members. Of course, you have you know, BSF. BSF is going to give us an insight into their bioplastics portfolio later. I'm very, very sorry that I have not first talked on this chart. I'm sorry, Linda, but you will show first talks portfolio later and you can see a few brand owners and also some of the waste managers. I didn't put Cardinal up this, uh, onto this chart, one of the, our news members, uh, I really have to do this someday. Oops. Oh. And this is just a bit uh, to give you an overview of how our organization is working. Of course, we have the members and uh, the board. At the uh, right side, you can see the current board, which is going to be, uh, well, we have an election in two months, actually. So. Um, We'll see if new faces are coming up. And this is my boss, actually, has a Pompovro and myself, and uh, technical support and communication support. So we are a small team, but um, while well, we're producing quite a bit, uh, together with our working groups, these are our internal committees. So we have experts from all the member uh, members are coming together a few times a year and are discussing topics and problems and challenges and also positive developments uh, concerning the most important properties of bioplastics, the biodegradability property and being bio-based. So what's happening there? Standardization-wise, Brussels-wise, you know the seedling, I hope everybody's seen the seedling or the equivalent of the SOT, for example. And um, yeah, we're also developing publications, as you see there. This is a brochure about environmental communication and please do it accurately concerning bioplastics that we published a few years ago. Our definition. I know there are quite a few definitions floating around, but we, <coughs> ours is quite broad. We say being bio-based is the main feature, but there are also some uh, products that are biodegradable and fossil-based. But these in the middle are usually mixed, compounded with those that are bio-based and also biodegradable properties, technical properties you are aiming for. So the middle and the right one, you can actually more or less see them together. So there's always a certain fraction, or fraction sounds tiny, a certain amount that is bio-based, should be bio-plastic. And where are we right now? We are nearly 1% of the annual plastics global production. That doesn't sound much, I know, but we have an immense uh, drive for growth. So actually, uh, bioplastics volumes are going, are quadrupling, great word, uh, quadrupling <laughs> in the next few years. 2013, here's our reference year because we published this end of 2014 and the year wasn't finished yet. So it's quite the newest data you can get right now. We are at about 1.6 million tons and uh, we are going to be, uh, we are going to grow until nearly 7 million tons in 2018. And this is quite a conservative scenario, but um, the huge bio-based, uh, bio not biodegradable column you see here, this is mainly one material that is driving this development. Every material is growing, but there are major investments in capacities and in facilities around the world. This is bio-based PT. Bio-based PT, 30%, not 100% bio-based. So this forecast is uh, provided that these facilities will really go on stream, but it looks like it. Huge companies like Coca-Cola and other brand owners have, um, and they have um, contracted volumes of these facilities. So it's not in a planning status, it's really in the implementation status already. So this, we uh, consider this as the least 
possible development that is going to happen. And that would put us to 2 or 3 percent of the, of the overall plastics market by around 2018, which sounds a bit more already. Here you can see with the development, um, bio-based, uh, not biodegradable is the green part, and uh, the current and the orange one is partly bio-based too, and biodegradable materials. So, um, you have, of course, you already the huge share of the bio-based PET, and it makes SNAP a bit like a Pac-Man when you see, in, yeah, when you have a look at the, how it will look like in the next years. But as I said, um, the orange parts, the biodegradable materials, and you will hear about several of them later, they are growing also, um, they are more than doubling also. PLA, for example, is uh, putting on, uh, is increasing 60% or so. PHA is also um, developing. So it's just one material, so it's a bit, so there might also be a few other facilities uh, producing PLA that we don't know yet about, because I heard something at Interpac last week that there is a product going on. So maybe they will open up a 200,000 uh, ton facility <coughs> and whoop, this graph will look totally different. So as we are quite a small volume market yet, there's lots of music into yeah, how it might look into years from us. Production-wise, um, right now, Europe has still fair, uh, fair share. Uh, North America is strong too. South America, that's mainly by a base PE of Bruscom. And, but a lot is already happening in Asia today. Thailand is a hub. Um, Malaysia is starting to be one. I think they are even, even recently I heard that Vietnam is looking how to set up a, an infrastructure. So there's, but for now it's mainly Thailand and China, of course, in China there are several PLA plants and PVAT plants. And this development is going on because, uh, well, certain countries have a good investment infrastructure, have certain programs, have support from uh, the governments, and in the EU we are a bit uh, reluctant on that. I will come later to that. So there are first steps now, first steps uh, making legislation, first steps really um, yeah, setting standards for biobased products, there we are a bit further advanced, but of course it's more complicated in the EU where we have lots of countries, and Thailand is one country, North America is one country, so it's good. Yeah. Yeah, but we really have to step up our game there, and I will tell you about that later. Just one chart to show. In the also the conventional plastics are not gaining in production because I'm take, uh, talking about production. That's just one side of the bioplastic song. So production is not growing here in Europe either for the conventionals, but outside. So our interest here is, of course, we want to attract a bit more production numbers, etc. I mean, the new commission, for example, has the um, has the strict guideline going for uh, industrial renaissance of Europe, so really creating jobs and uh, attracting investments to make it simpler to invest more or less in Europe. We'll see where that leads, but our um, there's a lot of conversion happening in Europe, and there's also Europe is a very important market, so. For example, these are just three of the names in the last weeks where news came out that they are not having bioplastic products yet, but IKEA, okay, that's been, that's been for a few months now. IKEA is doing a study on different types of bioplastics, looking into what might be suitable for them. And I mean, they are, yeah, they are very interesting to us because it's not only about little parts and furniture, but they are a huge restaurant chain, and they have food stores always, so they are all around, so this might be a really a break. Well, Let's just say we're in contact, and I hope that um, this study will develop until end of the year. And I know there's a representative of it somewhere here, which I haven't met yet. But uh, I hope that there will be some positive conclusions, and we'll see what comes out of it. Lavazza, one of the best coffee brands in the world, just recently did some tests uh, with no Gourmand about a coffee capsule. Well, you all have know, uh, you all have heard, I guess, that most of the coffee capsules are all arranged. We have four or five different producers up there. And Bras was the first one. They were definitely the first one. And Vinorella is great. We have it at every booth where we are at every trade fair. So, and uh, Bosch, also very important company, Bosch Packaging actually. Bosch Packaging is also doing a study a bit similar to IKEA and looks into different kinds of bioplastics. So I hope something tangible will come out of that. Maybe next week. We will see. But there's interested from uh, this. Values, uh, this step in the value chain different, uh, definitely, so maybe it will be more converting and more 
really uh, driving the products into the market. <coughs> maybe not so much the production part. Eventually, the commission will set a framework that this also will go. But these were packaging solutions only I was talking about. I mean, packaging is the major sector for bioplastics. It has been uh, the first one next to horticulture and agriculture where solutions were introduced. So it's the most developed one. So you have everything from multi-layer packaging to um, water bottles to what else is there. Yeah, well, let's come catering to that too. So you have very different, uh, very, very diverse solutions here. But um, do I have a second chart? No, I don't have a second chart. If you would have this for 2018, packaging would go through the roof, okay? But then that's because of the bio-based PET partly, again, because lots of that goes into bottles and bottles is, is a packaging application, so. <coughs> but automotive and textiles are, for example, also growing quite immensely. So you have, for example, cushions for the, for the chairs in the car, or you have, um, you have uh, motor covers, or you have um, yeah, bits and pieces in the cockpit that are made of bioplastics, bio-based polymines, even uh, fuel lines that are integrated. So there's uh, quite a few applications. And in the textile business, um, cellulosic-based fibers or PLA fibers, etc. They're sports, um, sports shirts that have good breathing uh, abilities, properties. Or um, there, for example, <coughs> one of my favorite, quite exotic application is a hazmat suit that one of our UK, mem uh, UK members is uh, contributing to. So this uh, chemical uh, anti-poison hmm, security suit is having a certain, it is, it would be compostable, but not in the suit. So it has, a, it enhances the breathability so that people can actually wear the suit longer should there be an emergency situation. Don't have a picture of that, but you find the picture on our website if you want to see it. Uh, doesn't look so nice, but technicality, great thing. So now a few um, <coughs> products. So this is a combination, and I just heard we have somebody of the paper industry sitting there, so this is maybe interesting for you. This is a combination of uh, cardboard and of PLA film to keep the, um, yeah, the nice salads and the wraps and everything uh, fresh. And of course here, if you have a composting infrastructure and uh, you have a retail, uh, you have a retailer who has that in their fresh assortment cooling, Cupboard or what's it called? A guy. Well, uh, assortment, and um, everything unfortunately uh, turns bad, and then he can just throw it theoretically in the bin, which would be, um, yeah, a benefit because he doesn't have to sort everything. But of course, this is provided that you have a waste infrastructure that supports that. And of course, it's certified. <coughs> But uh, I don't see the certification here, but it is ASTM or uh, OK Compost certified. You know the plant bottle. This is the bio PET, 30% up to now because the terephthalic acid is not yet, still not yet um, produced in an economically feasible way, so that yeah, it can be put up to 100%. And this is another application. This is bio-based PE. Um, actually, Pantene. Um, did have this in share or still has this in share of their bottle, but they're not mentioning it. So the investment they are doing, they are not mentioning it. I mean, it's PE in the end. It has the same chemical property, so you can just mix it with uh, the virgin oil PE, and you have a certain reduction, of course, of the carbon footprint of your product in the end. But, um, well, they said, no, we are not making marketing about this, so they just didn't mention it. I mean, the end of life stays the same, the, tech, uh, the properties stay the same. So. It was an investment for that. And uh, also in these uh, other, I'm not sure if it's all of them, I must admit, but this um, Max Factor Beauty line, they also um, use some of the bio -based. I was talking about this. This is a beauty cover for uh, the engine of a Mercedes A-Class, and this is made with, I think, from DSM, it was a bio-based right? I think it's called Ecoparts. And, uh, yeah, so it's a very demanding application, heat, uh, all the vibrations that come from the motor, etc. So, and Mercedes, I guess, wouldn't uh, jeopardize the quality of its products. So, quite an impressive mm -hmm. application there. <coughs> One of 
my favorite. Actually, one of the journalists I use, uh, I'm working with, went really to this company and got herself one of these uh, jackets because she's an outdoor person and she was totally, oh my god, a bioplastics application that, uh, yeah, that I can use. This is uh, the outer shell is water resistant and it has breathability and it's a bio-based polymer by one of our members, Tori. So, but it's not all bio-based, but parts of it have been substituted. And it's from a uh, German company. <coughs> they even won an outdoor award for it. Mm -hmm. Move on. Yeah. Another application from the uh, consumer electronics sector this is the USB charger. This is actually the older model. The new looks like a ginkgo tree. It's also it one. Uh, it's um, from Poly One. It's a bio-based PE. Um, no, 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 it's a bio-based polymide, partly bio-based polymide, and uh, it has been designed with a Chinese design lab and has also been designed by this one. We have one at uh, at our office. It works fine. Sometimes we always get two of the little silver panels, but we took it to several trade fairs with us, so we were quite rough with it. So, <laughs> so, so far for um, where bio plastic uh, volumes are standing, where the market is standing, and let's come to a very, very important part of, um, yeah, a very important topic that will help the market to grow. Actually, it's standardization. It means that you get um, test methods that you get, uh, <coughs> reference points for your product so that you hopefully can explain to your customers um, more transparently what your product really does achieve and that you have had it tested and that they can also verify. So I'm just giving you a brief overview <coughs> of what's already there and what's in the making. So because we have already quite a bit, which is very good. I'm also personally um, involved in one or two of the uh, I never can say that. Comité européen de normes, Central European Standardization Body. Yes. Uh, so I'm involved in one or two of the um, committees that are dealing with consumer uh, communication and with business to business communication. So, um, but let's start at the beginning. Let's start at what are we with the feedstock, so the bio based part of the product. There is a clear technical specification. The 16137 that gives a guideline on how you should measure that. And uh, there's also another approach to it which has been developed in France by the Association Simulation uh, Association Time, which is not focusing on the bio-based carbon content of the product, which of course is it is based on that method, but it measures more. So it measures the carbon content, the bio-based carbon content, and then it also looks at nitrogen and all the other elements that are still there. So usually uh, the determination of bio-based mass content, because more, more mass is taken into account, will be a bit higher. Which is of course attractive if you want to communicate the, most, the highest possible bio-based content that there is, but there is no standard yet for that. So there is a procedure and it's soundly developed, but um, well, we are a bit further with determining the bio-based content. And um, well, when we are looking at bio-based products altogether, from terminology to what I just said, bio-based, um, how to um, measure actually bio-based content, to how to communicate it to sustainability aspects, uh, the biomass, how it is grown. And we have uh, one technical committee at CEN level at the moment for bio-based products. They have five working groups. I'm in number five for the communication, as I just said. And um, it's quite a complex. Uh, process. There are several country, uh, countries and other expert stakeholders sitting around a table and there are so many national uh, status quo or whatever the, uh, the plural of that word, uh, <coughs> word is. Uh, so it's a long journey to arrive at a standard and then of course there's a consultation based on to see if what you have produced is really meeting the practical demands of the brand owners or other other stakeholders. So, but um, terminology, I think that has already, there has been already a uh, yeah, very good document created. Bio-based content, well, we already have a technical specification, as I said, and uh, the bio-based mass content uh, approach is also taken up. There are some other approaches which I'm not going into right now, I'm not too confused too much. Um, 
sustainability aspects uh, that are still in the making and certification and declaration, the communication part, there has been a draft standard for business to business communication. We will see if that needs to be reworked. And we are currently working on a standard how to, um, yeah, how to uh, present your product to the consumer. But um, uh, yeah, actually, the ambition there is you may all know um, ISO standard, the 14020 series, about how to do environmental communication accurately. Or maybe you have heard about that. That standard has been around for 15 years. So it is good, it is a good basis, but I think our demands today are a bit more complex. So I think actually it would need a bit, yeah, to be specified in certain ways because new technologies have come up new claims have been invented, new products have seen the light of day. I mean, 15 years ago, the bioplastics market was really something completely else. Now everybody's interested and everybody is aware. And this B2C standard that's coming, I'm just trying to push it a bit further. But yeah, as I said, it's, it's really a bit what should be made mandatory. So if you have a bio-based claim, what uh, do you always have to provide a certification? Are you not allowed to do a bio-based claim when you not have uh, really measure the bio-based content and uh, if you cannot uh, give a percentage uh, is it then greenwashing even though you might have just wanted to save some money and here there is bio-based so it's, yeah you will know when it comes out if you're interested then or if you just drop me your card or drop me a note in it's maybe a half a year or a year and then I might have a document for you and further information because it will still take, uh, take a bit of time but once it's there, it will make things easier. <coughs> and of course, you have some general, um, of, of course, composting at end of life now, and industrial composting, while well, the seedling, I hope you have seen it. There's also an equivalent by Monsanto, the OK Compost logo. And, um, well, it's been around for over 10 years. Uh, I think the OK Compost is maybe the 20 years, I think. It sets clear standards. Um, the seedling is based on this standard. There is a certification in between. So, and there's also an American equivalent, Elytra and ISO equivalent. So, um, this is a very clear thing. So, if a product is called industrial compostable, you have a norm, you have a certification, you have a standard, uh, you have a label. So, um, it's actually everything is out in the open there. Um, we even have a certifier network which is growing. It's uh, with Densatco uh, and Bonsot, and also cooperation partners in the countries where they are working. Home composting is the next interesting thing because in not every country um, has a huge industrial composting infrastructure, and maybe because of whatever reasons they are not going to settle up. So home composting is the next interesting thing, and as I'm told, Sweden is among the countries where home composting is an interesting option. So um, there is no standard, there is a certification, because sometimes standardization takes too long, and certifiers already, uh, based on the norms they have, develop the middle of this package norm uh, certification label. Um, and it's quite a good blueprint, but now uh, it needs to be Put into that. Well, there need to be there needs to be really good, there need to be standards to be developed on national member level. This is uh, on national member state level, EU member state level. This is actually going to be to happen sooner than on EU level. On EU level, the necessity has been acknowledged. We will see if we get there. But France is already on the way. So meaning France has uh, this law coming up, and in the uh, other um, other auditorium out in the Almia conference. There one, uh, one man mentioned it actually. Um, France is working on a law that is um, about biodegradable bags, compostable bags. But they also go a bit further, they determine the minimum bio-based content, which I haven't seen so much, and not in legislation up to now. So they're really determining the bio-based, so it's about bio-based, biodegradable products, products that can do both. But they are also uh, looking to develop a home composting standard because in France it's also an important composting option. So whatever France is developing there will be very interesting for the EU level and maybe also for Swedish authorities. So France is in Italy, more or less. Not, not of course saying that Italy is not <coughs> the pioneering biofestival country. <laughs> and of course, well, this is 
just very shortly, of course, life cycle assessment, carbon footprinting, certain uh, general standards that you apply to all products as well, but that are important for every bio product or every product that you're bringing into the market. And for the feedstock, just because we're using bio-based resources, uh, feedstock um, certifications like ICC plus or SP related uh, certifications like Bonsucro or um, working landscape programs in the US for corn are yeah, also something that you should have a look to when you're really talking about where you grew your feedstock and where you have it from. If you make claims about the specific feedstock you use, then this is, uh, this is a link you should be That was the document I was uh, talking about and also um, two years ago, we drafted this in an internal working group, and it's based on the ISO standard that I mentioned, this communication standard that maybe needs a bit more details. Um, it's fine for now, and I think we've done good work to um, tell people how ideally end-of-life claims should be made, or when they should be made, and how they should not be made, and also how to communicate by base. So actually, our main message is, if you say something, provide proof how you provide it if you do it on the packaging or if you do it on the website or so, that is not fixed yet. It's maybe the standard that is upcoming that will try to determine how you should do it. Maybe that's a bit too much, we'll see. But um, for now, it is a good uh, guideline, I think, and <coughs> when these new standards come out, we'll of course adapt it, but it, it's B2B communication and B2C communication. Now let's come to lobbying. Now we have... Uh, checked out how, where the market stands right now and we have heard a bit about the um, projects and certification that are ongoing and as uh, this is definitely, as I said, an important point for the market to grow to make clearer how certificates should work. Now what's happening on the EU level? I mean the whole idea of the bioeconomy has been, it, it's 10 years old, it's been 10 years since the European Union started to be really active there and put out their first communications. 10 years is not so long. And a lot has happened. I didn't list everything that happened since then. I took the last few years. So you have general umbrella communications like the resource efficiency strategy or like the bioeconomy strategy in general. Broad communications, broad plans, broad roadmaps. And bioplastics are included somewhere there. And yes, there's a certain commitment that bioplastics are an important pillar of the bioeconomy. But uh, there are there's no specific um, specific framework, legislative suggestions or processes, or have not been until recently, um, that are focusing on materials. So there's fuels, there is energy, but materials are a bit, they are coming now, so we'll see what happens in the next years. And for bioplastics specifically, um, we saw, but I'm jumping a bit already, I have to pull myself back, I'm sorry, we so see here, let's come to this. Um, the green paper on waste strategy, that was uh, actually one of the first uh, uh, the first dossiers where we can, could actually hook ourselves to and where we could be active. So mostly uh, lobbying had been monitoring until a few years ago and uh, sometimes answering a consultation where we roughly fit in. But now the first more tangible proposals are coming, for example, also, well, we had light work, uh, which is a reduction of light weight bags. We were very active there. That was our big introduction to Brussels, more or less, because we tried to get exemptions for our products. I will come to that uh, in a minute. And uh, then there was the waste fitness check, which went on for the last years and was withdrawn, actually. Um, well, they said they would withdraw it in December, and in March, they, uh, the new commission that actually withdrew this package. Uh, and now we are back to the start, which I will come to later, too. And the new start is called Circular Economy Proposal 2015. And what we are doing there, I will partly share with you, as far as I can, because we're still a bit on the, in the uh, at the beginning. But generally, before I get into these, uh, into these uh, processes, our aims in Brussels are to make, of course, to establish a relationship with the key stakeholders that are in the Commission, in the Council, and also in the, or mostly in the Parliament. So those who are responsible, for example, for the Environment Committee, and then there's a certain dossier, and there's a rapporteur uh, determined for this dossier, and we want to talk to him, or to, usually he has four or five shadow rapporteurs, meaning these people are also working with them within the different parties. 
So these people are very important to us, but also, of course, key stakeholders are other associations. So, I mean, the bioeconomy has got to their computer, for example, or the starch industry, or Europa Bio, very known, but broader than European bioplastics. So there are quite a few people to talk to, actually. And two years, three years ago, it was uh, also, I have the feeling that with these key people that we've talked over the last two years, the uh, idea of bioplastics is a bit more tangible, again, it's my favorite word of the day, tangible, than it has been two years ago. So um, we are getting our information across. It's, it's a very tedious task sometimes, and you have to go via, multi, uh, via many channels, but, um, and mostly you really have to do it in personal talks, even if you just get 20 minutes, but you stand there and you really have to tell them what bioplastics are, what they can and what they cannot do, because they are not a solution for everything. There's a solution for certain parts. And um, of course we want to then, these responsible stakeholders, these who are really, um, really working on these dossiers, these we would like, to, they are having different groups that are influencing them, but we really want them to um, at least have the facts right about our, our, our products. And um, that is what we do in engagement programs, meaning for certain dossiers, we are having contact programs. We are meeting 20, 30 people over a few months at certain stages of these, um, when these dossiers is processed. So there are certain uh, discussions of the dossier and elect uh, votings in the parliament, etc. And then it goes to the, to the other institutions. So there are certain stations in this process where we have different, where we're talking to different uh, institutions. And of course, we are sharing our material, and we're still answering to public consultations, of course, mainly related to these dossiers, but sometimes there is um, a broader consultation where we're also sharing our input. And uh, as I just, uh, as I also mentioned, uh, the, recent, the most recent network we joined is the European Bioeconomy Alliance. It's very feedstock-based, but the starch uh, producing uh, companies are there, and uh, also the um, Forestry is there, and uh, well, the Farmers Association is there, but um, also Europa Bio and uh, Bioplastics Industries Consortium. So a bit different. It's a it's a quite colorful mix of twelve associations that have joined this alliance, and it has a broader scope. So it's good for us to position ourselves in Brussels. But the concrete work on the dossiers for our industry, the bioplastics industry, that's happening through. 2011 we started. This was still, even when we had no concrete dossier really to work on, or we didn't work on any, uh, we had no problem finding an MEP, uh, a European parliamentarian who supported us, and we had a 50, 60 people conference in the parliament, and this was a bit the kick off for us to get more active and to really show up. It had also to do that we had positions by then and really uh, were working in all the important committees, so the interest grew and uh -huh, the plastic bags um, legislation so ah, yeah. so what did happen actually what was the focus of this legislation of this proposal in the beginning what happened in between and what came out in the end how are we uh, positioning ourselves towards that um, the idea behind it was oh we have so much uh, marine litter let's reduce the bags of course, that's not solving the problem. That is one product. Bags are not even the biggest share of pollution. But it's, uh, my keyword again, it's a tangible little project and it's a start. So, and in the uh, altogether, uh, going for a responsible consume and uh, reduce, maybe making people aware that you should not consume uh, a single use product like uh, over, um, yeah, not a bunch of into high volumes. Um, in general, we, of course, agreed with that. Um, so they kind of limited the scope to light with single-use plastic bags, which, of course, hit also our market. And we were we wanted to make sure that bio-based lightweight plastic bags and biodegradable lightweight plastic bags uh, were acknowledged for their additional features. So for not having such a high carbon footprint or being biodegradable, meaning collecting bio waste, not ending up so much in the nature, 
and uh, getting the bio-waste out of other waste streams, so there was an additional use. The carbon footprint argument, unfortunately, for those bags that were not biodegradable, were not paying into this help to reduce marine litter argument, because it was not an end-of-life connected argument, so uh, this was not the right to see to push this argument. So we were focusing on biodegradable light bag single-use bags. And these, uh, even the commission did even an assessment that these are less likely to be littered, way less likely to be littered than conventional lightweight bags because they have this double use and people really started to collect more bio-waste. And uh, so they were then ending up in the, uh, in the waste stream, of course, that was suitable for that. So um, in the end, we, yeah, a charge was discussed for bags and it was also talk about exempting biodegradable com certified compostable and here, so it was compostable bags uh, from these uh, charges. But there was a formal, um, well, when the new commission came into place, and this had already been voted one, once, and it was just uh, the final step to be made, the commission introduced a new uh, change in the process, more or less, and uh, a unanimous vote of all the member countries was needed to push this, uh, this and other provisions that were in this proposal through. And there was one country who didn't want it, and so we don't have an exemption for biodegradable bags now at the moment. But we have a four minutes. Four minutes. That's good. Mm -hmm. I can do that. I didn't think that I would really talk forty minutes here. Okay. Um, all in all, uh, the reduction of lightweight bags is something that we welcome, of course. Um, the new. The uh, amendment of the Packaging and Packaging Waste Directive clearly said that the EN13432 industrial composting is the guiding standard also for biodegradability. This is very important to us because it uh, separates us from the oxofragmentable materials, which I hope you have heard about already. Also, it was uh, made clear that there's an interest to improve biodegradability <coughs> and compostability labeling. Very important for us too, to separate from uh, from materials that do not perform or just pretend to perform like old bioplastics. And uh, then uh, the most positive outcome, though I must say that we missed a chance to ban OXOs in December, and now they are doing an assessment of the impact, the environmental impact of OXO biodegradable bags for the next two years. And then we'll see where we are. And of course, we will give input to this process. And this is just the slide about saying they're going to do this assessment and. Uh, I think they're still talking about if it should be a desktop study uh, or should it be a totally new uh, database study. This is of course an OXO. There is not so much sun in a deep, deep uh, river and so maybe an OXO bag is not really looking like that after 55 days then. Unfortunately, I cannot talk about this alone. There was a waste business proposal looking at, um, looking at the waste targets around Europe. Uh, the Commission and the institutions worked for quite a while on it. When the new Commission came, uh, came they refocused their, um, yeah, the, the aims of their term more into jobs and economic growth and cut a bit down the environmental legislation goals. And this, the waste fitness check was one of those. There was a huge uh, screen from uh, NGOs, bioeconomy associations and everybody. Now they have said they are going to propose a more comprehensive proposal, a circular economy package. Also including not only waste, but waste, the waste, the old waste package is coming back, aren't they? It will be renegotiated, mm -hmm. uh, new elements maybe, I mean. And, uh, but there will also be a part that um, is uh, looking at bio-based products, eco-design, etc. This is very interesting for us. And as they had some as in the old proposal, the provisions for uh, separate bio, uh, separate uh, bio waste collection, uh, not so favorable to us. Actually, not a not a bad status quo we have right now. So we're at the beginning of the process. There is an interesting package coming up. We're at the beginning of the process, talking to the Parliament at the moment again about this and our our position. Way too small, I know, but I guess the presentation will be shared. This is. Uh, this an extract and of course the format, uh, whatever. Um, if you are interested, there is a position paper on our website which is presenting the latest uh, thoughts of us regarding the circular economy package. So you can have a look. So what legislation you really would like to tackle and what changes you would propose. 
This is about the bioeconomy alliance, I already said this, and if you are interested in bioplastics, you can always ask Bo and the Nordic uh, Association, of course, but I hope you will, of course, you will be present at, in November at our conference again. So for not a matter of whoever, you are always invited. Um, our topic this year is uh, Shaping Smart Solutions, because we are bio-based and we, have, uh, we are diversifying end-of-life options, so that sounds smart to us, and uh, solutions, yeah, that's why we're here, so we thought it was a good claim. <laughs> and if you would like to know more about bioplastics, please join us in November, and or give me a call if you have a good idea for a presentation. Always, always open for that. And that's it. Thank you so much.